Good afternoon, tributes. Let's carry on with the next five games. The 51st games took place in an abandoned hospital. They featured crafty cats, a feline infestation, and lasted for seven days. After the success of last year's games, this year did not disappoint and was the unusual setting for an unforgettable year. This year's victor was Lime Christie, aged 18, from District 2. As Tribute's podiums raised to the ground, many of them were confused to see that they were surrounded by an old dilapidated building, and that they were in fact in the courtyard of this building. There was also a set of old double doors along each of the four walls of this building, which led many Tributes to agonise over which door they should take in order to escape the courtyard. Meanwhile, Lime and a small number of other tributes noticed that within the rusty and defunct fountain in the centre of the courtyard, there appeared to be no weapons present. However, all the supplies had been placed into clear waterproof boxes. During pre-game discussions amongst the career tributes, Paragon, from one, had nominated himself to give the start plan signal to the rest of the careers. Therefore, when Paragon realised that there were no weapons, he tapped his neck twice, then scratched his head whilst making eye contact with Lime which meant that these two would work together, with Paragon holding down a tribute whilst Lime would snap their neck and kill them. This also meant that Stella from 1 and Sirius from 2 would carry out the same plan on their side of the cornucopia. When the gong sounded, the plan worked perfectly, and within a minute the two pairs of careers had killed seven tributes so quickly and effectively that footage of this bloodbath was later used in training academies in order to teach starting communication tactics to potential new career tributes. This also led to most other tributes immediately fleeing the bloodbath, and there were still many supplies left by the time these non-career tributes had also fled the cornucopia courtyard. Over the first two days, Lime and the other careers discovered that this building used to be a hospital, and they were also surprised by how big this hospital seemed to be. But like many other tributes, they became somewhat lost within its disorientating layout. However, they managed to yank bars off the beds and the old curtain equipment, and this allowed them each a kind of makeshift spear. Over the rest of the second day, once the pack had these spears, they patrolled the east wing of the hospital and trapped various tributes, managing to kill Wagner from 10 and Dolly from 11, whilst the pair hid under a bed in the paediatric ward. However, shortly after the body claws, which were attached to holes in the ceiling, had removed these bodies, the careers noticed a pack of cats curiously approaching them. They seemed harmless, but just as Lime and the other careers were walking away, one of the cats jumped onto Lime's back, then she and the other careers pushed it off and shooed it away. Although it caused no harm to Lime, it left her rather wary of the cats. By the fourth day, the number of tributes had dropped to ten. Then, whilst trying to locate more tributes in the East Wing, Paragon thought he heard voices coming from the dark room, which appeared to be an old supply cupboard. Lime and Sirius kept watch from the corridor, while Stella stood in the doorway and waited for Paragon to locate the light switch. Stella stated that the floor was wet and that water was coming up to her ankles, but Paragon told her not to moan. Just as Lime thought she heard movement come from a nearby room, the light switched on and Paragon let out a deafening scream before collapsing in the water, with his cannon immediately sounding. As Lime and Sirius looked aghast into the now-lit room, they saw that there was indeed water covering the floor and that wires had been ripped out from the electrical sockets and were dangling into the water. Lime correctly guessed that the tributes from District 3 were responsible for this. Meanwhile, Stella, who had also been badly electrocuted, crawled out of the room while screaming in pain. As Stella begged for help and crawled nearer to Sirius and Lime, Sirius shouted at Lime not to touch Stella, as she could also be electrocuted. Lime slowly edged back as Stella carried on screaming, but at that moment some rather miserable looking cats turned the corner into the corridor and trotted towards Stella. After the earlier incident, Lime was unsure of what these cats would do to Stella, but she did not want to find out, so she and Sirius fled down the corridor, while Stella crawled out of the puddle and got her spear ready to throw at them. Although the cats had not seemed to have violent intentions, the second they saw the spear, they jumped straight at Stella, and all clawed at her face simultaneously. As Lime and Sirius continued running, they heard her cannon sound. By the sixth day, there were only six tributes remaining, Although Lime and Sirius both felt safe, they started itching their arms and legs. Shortly after this itching started, the game makers announced that all tributes had now been infected with an especially virulent species of fleas that had been transferred onto them by the cats in the arena. They continued to say that these fleas would soon cause acute blood poisoning, unless these tributes injected themselves with a vaccine that would now be placed in the maternity ward, which would stop their itching and save them from further illness and even death. Sirius told Lime that he could remember where the maternity ward was, and without hesitation, led her directly to it. 
Once they had made it to the room opposite the ward, they looked across and through a window at the room's wall. They saw five identical syringes in a container in the middle of the room, meaning that someone had likely arrived already. Lime quietly communicated to Sirius that he should be the one to get the syringes as he was stronger than her. He obliged to this, and Lime later admitted that she did this as from where she was sat, she saw a human shadow moving through the window, and wanted Sirius to be attacked first instead of her. When Sirius opened the door, Lime thought that she may have been mistaken, however immediately after, she heard Rasputin from Four attacking Sirius. As Lime ran into the room, the pair of them were rolling on the floor and trying to strangle each other, whilst a flea-infested cat sat in the corner of the room seemingly unaffected. Realising that now was her chance to eliminate Sirius, Lime took two syringes, however she emptied the contents of one of these syringes onto the floor, and then grabbed the cat and withdrew its infected blood into the syringe instead. Just as Sirius was being strangled by Rasputin, Lime put the syringes down in different places before grabbing her spear and ramming it through Rasputin's head. As Sirius got his breath back, Lime very carefully checked the syringes and handed him the infected syringe before they injected themselves with their respective antidotes. After the incident that had occurred earlier involving the tributes from District 3, Lime convinced Sirius that they should leave in order to not risk encountering them when they came to collect their syringes. As they continued walking back to the courtyard, Sirius started itching intensely and then coughing blood onto the floor. As dusk had now fallen and the pair were both tired, Lime suggested that they both sleep in a nearby room that could be locked, before looking for a cure for Sirius the next day. However, just as Sirius was locking the door, he once again coughed violently and even vomited a little. He then looked at Lime with a shocked and disgusted look before shouting that she had not given him the vaccine. He staggered forward to her whilst demanding to know what had been in the syringe, but as he did so he slipped on some of his own blood and started convulsing. Lime was surprised at how quickly this plan had worked to kill Sirius, and without wasting any time, she unlocked the door and ran away as quickly as she could, whilst hearing the sound of Sirius's cannon echoing through the hospital. During the night, Lime slept in one of the toilet cubicles on the other side of the hospital, and as dawn approached, she heard the cannon of Damston from Five billowing through the building, meaning that Faraday and Flick, both from Three, had probably killed him. As Lime very carefully explored the south wing, she realised that access to the courtyard and the other wings was now restricted, and that Faraday and Flick must be fairly close. Just as she was thinking about where they could be, she heard a scream from a nearby room followed by a cannon. This meant that either Flick or Faraday was now her only remaining opponent. Just as Lime saw a new pack of cats down the corridor rather hastily approaching her, she quickly dived into another nearby room and closed the door as quickly, yet quietly, as she could. She hid behind a nearby bed and got her spear ready. A minute or two went by and the moment that Lime considered moving from the spot, Faraday pulled the curtain down onto Lime's head, stopping her from seeing anything. It had been very tense and almost cringeworthy for District 2 viewers to watch, as Lime had been confused by the location of the earlier scream, and then just happened to hide right next to where Faraday was also hiding. At first it appeared that Faraday was going to suffocate Lime, and she desperately tried to fight him off without being able to see him. However, when she heard his breathing, she shoved forward and headbutted him, which knocked him to the ground. During the scuffle, Lime had dropped her spear, but she then picked it back up as quickly as she could, and slammed it straight through Faraday's mouth, which killed him almost immediately, and left Lime as the victor. Upon achieving victory, Lime returned to District 2, but unlike most victors, she chose not to take up a position in the training academy. She instead chose to lead a quiet life in the victor's village, but was later disgraced when she fought alongside rebels during the rebellion of 76, which ultimately saw her demise at the hands of the capital. The 52nd games took place in a meadow forest. They featured friendly deer, an earthquake, and lasted for 10 days. Most victors are at least pleased when they have won, but this was unfortunately not the case this year. When Tristan's 12-year-old sister, Willow, was unexpectedly reaped for the games, he was left in shock, but realising that she might just have a chance of survival if he were in the arena with her, he quickly volunteered himself as the male tribute for the games. When the gong sounded, both Tristan and Willow immediately ran to grab supplies, but Tristan was pushed to the floor by Ares from one, whilst Willow aimed for a backpack. However, when Willow was about to grab a backpack, Hux from Ten approached her from behind with an axe. As Tristan saw what was about to happen, he grabbed Hux's arm and pushed him away from Willow. She panicked and fled the cornucopia clearing without any supplies, 
whilst Tristan grabbed the backpack and a knife before running from Hux, who was now pursuing him with an axe. When Hux caught up with Tristan, he very nearly stabbed him with an axe, which made Tristan drop his knife. However, he managed to pick up the knife again, and Hux ran straight into it, impaling him and leading him to die shortly afterwards. Meanwhile, once Willow stopped fleeing and rested, she was approached by Syndra from Nine, who asked for an alliance if she helped Willow find Tristan. The plan was accepted by Willow, and they worked together, agreeing to follow the careers who Syndra thought would lead them to Tristan, due to his high training score, which would make him the career's prime target. Over the next few days, Syndra and Willow survived by rationing the food that Syndra had gathered from the cornucopia, whilst they followed the careers and witnessed them kill more and more of the remaining tributes. As for Tristan, he continued to avoid the careers and ate the deer, whilst drinking water from the stream. Each of the nights that the fallen tributes were shown in the sky, the siblings were relieved to see that the other's picture was not featured. On the ninth day, a minor earthquake shook the arena. Although most tributes, including Syndra, Willow and Tristan, were not affected, the tremors made Willow's necklace, which was her token, fall off her neck and to the ground, without her realising. When the ground stopped shaking, Syndra decided to have a nap, whilst Willow continued to spy on the careers. However, after a short amount of time, they turned back round and Willow ran back and woke up Syndra. As the careers returned and walked along the path, Willow and Syndra hid behind a fallen tree. However, as the careers were passing, Mason from Two spotted Willow's necklace on the ground and realised that she must be nearby. As they searched, they were surprised to not just find her, but also Syndra. They taunted the pair for a while before they were about to start torturing them for information on Tristan's location, but unbeknownst to the careers, Tristan was surprisingly close to where they had gathered and crept up in order to watch what was occurring. Just as Tristan heard Mason mention killing Willow and Syndra, Tristan acted quickly and threw a spear at Mason, killing him instantly. Following this distraction, Tristan approached Ares and they fought using their weapons, whilst Jem, from one, ran after Syndra and Willow, who had both fled with their supplies. When Tristan was about to be killed by Ares, he grabbed a rock and knocked Ares unconscious. He then ran in the direction that Willow and Syndra had run, but whilst trying to work out which path they had taken, Jem appeared from behind a tree and threw a knife straight at his shoulder. They subsequently stumbled towards each other in an effort to fight, but Tristan managed to stab Jem first, which made her collapse to the ground in pain. Tristan ran off to find Willow, and shortly after he left, Ares regained consciousness and approached Jem, before realising that due to her wound, she would now be a liability, and so he killed her. Shortly after Jem's death, Willow managed to find Tristan, and they joyfully reunited and rested with Syndra, whilst Willow took care of the injuries that they had sustained from the careers. As Willow had now found Tristan, Syndra worried that she would no longer be considered useful. She grabbed a bottle, saying that she was going to get water from a nearby stream, but before going to the stream, she waited behind a nearby tree and overheard Willow and Tristan discussing her. Syndra did not want to take any chances, and that night, whilst Willow and Tristan slept, she grabbed one of the backpacks and ran back to the cornucopia. When Syndra reached the cornucopia, she tried taking some supplies, but was tackled by T from Two, who was about to kill her. However, Ares convinced T not to, as she would be able to lead them to Willow and Tristan. Syndra led Ares and T through the forest, and when she said that they were near to where they were, Ares snapped her neck and killed her. Syndra's cannon woke up Tristan and Willow, and as soon as they realised that Syndra was missing, they were very nearly hit by an arrow shot by T. Tristan instructed Willow to run, which he did. He was then attacked by Ares, whilst Willow was chased by T. T almost killed Willow, but Willow put up a worthy fight, and T ultimately ran straight into a knife that Willow was holding, which killed her. Meanwhile, Ares gave a victory speech when he thought that he would be about to kill Tristan. However, Willow appeared and tried to stop Ares from killing her brother, but when she got in Ares' way, he stabbed her and she collapsed. As Willow lost consciousness, Tristan kept fighting Ares, determined to avenge his sister. In Tristan's anger, he managed to gain the upper hand over Ares and stabbed him through the neck with an axe, then held Willow as she lay dying. After winning, Tristan returned to District 7, but he felt intense survivor's guilt after he had failed to save his sister, and he went on to become an alcoholic and morphling addict before being killed in the Victor's Purge of 75. The 53rd Games took place on a waterfall island. They featured territorial tigers, a mutt chase, and lasted for six days. A very strong victor will sometimes start to sabotage their competition before the games have even begun. This year's victor was Tatiana Nielsen, age 17, from District 2. The night before the games began, 
Tatiana led a tactical discussion with the other careers, where they each selected two of their competition that they would aim to kill in the bloodbath. The mentors were also present for this discussion and approved these plans. Therefore, when the gong sounded, it came as a great surprise to both the career mentors and the viewers when Tatiana grabbed a crossbow from the cornucopia, but then instead of targeting the non-career tributes, she proceeded to target the other three career tributes and either killed them or caused them to be injured and then killed by other tributes. Most of the remaining tributes ran away from the cornucopia clearing, either to kill their opponents or to escape Tatiana, who was still patrolling the clearing with a crossbow and taking back her arrows from the fallen tributes' bodies. Tatiana then took most of the supplies and hid these in bushes next to the clearing, while she left a few supplies within the clearing. She then waited in the bushes next to the supplies that she had hidden there and waited with her crossbow, ready to shoot. As the first three days went by, everything for Tatiana went to plan, with five more tributes trying to grab supplies and none even managing to get close before she had shot them dead. However, with only eight tributes remaining by the third night, and most of them desperate for food, and unable to explore far without angering the tigers, the game makers realised that they would have to do something in order to shake things up a bit, with even capital viewers becoming bored of Tatiana's overbearing strategy. Therefore, as dawn broke on the fourth day, the game makers announced that the tigers would travel to the cornucopia. Tatiana was unaware of any tigers, as she had not ventured very far at all into the arena, but she did not want to risk encountering them, so she grabbed some supplies and ran away from the cornucopia. As Tatiana ran, she looked for trees to climb so that she could be out of the way of the tigers, but unfortunately for her, all the trees within a kilometre of the cornucopia were too thin to climb without them breaking under her weight. As Tatiana ran further and further, she was suddenly caught in a trap, and before she even knew what had happened, she was hanging upside down by her foot, which was stuck in a piece of rope. Much to her annoyance, her crossbow had also fallen onto the floor and was out of her reach. As Tatiana tried to lift her body up so that she could free her foot, she heard cheering and laughter coming from behind another nearby tree, and Conifer and Carissa, both from Eleven, appeared from behind it. Conifer slyly walked over to Tatiana and mocked her for having walked into their trap, whilst Carissa rummaged through Tatiana's backpack, which had dropped to the floor. As soon as she found a loaf of bread, she pulled it out and ate it, without caring about any form of dining etiquette. However, Conifer was annoyed at the lack of supplies that Tatiana had with her, and he held the crossbow to her head in order to get an answer about where the rest of the supplies were. Tatiana stayed quiet and tried to think of how she could escape, but just as she thought that Conifer would lose his patience and kill her, he was suddenly knocked to the floor. A tiger had jumped out of nowhere and wrestled Conifer to the ground. As Carissa screamed and started to run, another tiger jumped at her, biting her neck and killing her quickly. Whilst both of these tigers proceeded to attack Conifer, Tatiana used her hands to pull herself up the rope that was holding her foot, and she kept pulling herself up until she had reached the attached branch. The tigers finished off Conifer, and he and Carissa's cannon sounded. The tigers then started eating their bodies, but as the hovercraft approached to retrieve them, they were scared off and continued back to the cornucopia. Tatiana untangled her foot and climbed down from the tree and grabbed her backpack. However, unfortunately for her, her crossbow had been broken during the fight. She decided to carry on walking away from the cornucopia and uphill towards the top of the waterfall. She then stayed there until there were just three other tributes remaining, as this allowed her to see lots of what was happening within the rest of the arena. However, during the fifth night, Tatiana saw a fire that had been lit in a nearby forest, so she walked down the hill and towards this fire. As she approached, she could just about hear Newton and Quarter, both from five, talking by the fire about where Tatiana and Lydia from Nine might be. Tatiana listened to their conversation from behind a nearby tree, desperately trying to hear anything about Lydia's whereabouts, but to no avail. However, as Newton decided to relieve himself away from Quarter in the nearby bushes, he walked straight past Tatiana's tree. Realising that she needed to act now, Tatiana crept up on Newton whilst he was urinating, and snapped his neck, which sounded his cannon. Quarter immediately jumped to her feet and grabbed a stick which he set on fire. As Tatiana came back and appeared by the fire, Quarter threatened her with a burning stick, sometimes jabbing it in Tatiana's direction and telling her to back off. Tatiana took her time and circled the fire simultaneously to Quarter. After a few tense moments of Quarter's threats, an animal trod on a nearby stick which caused some noise and distracted Quarter. Tatiana seized upon the opportunity and lunged forward, grabbing Quarter by her hair plaits and then pulling her down towards the fire. 
Korta screamed out in pain as her head started burning. Then Tatiana grabbed the burning stick and shoved it through Korta's head until her cannon sounded. That night, Tatiana returned to the top of the waterfall and fell asleep, exhausted from the day's events. However, as she awoke, she heard footsteps running towards her, and as she quickly rolled over, she was pinned to the ground by Lydia, just metres away from the edge of the waterfall. Although both girls no longer had any weapons, Lydia strangled Tatiana as hard as she could, even pushing her head into the ground as she did this. Tatiana tried all she could to push Lydia off, but eventually she rolled over and managed to get on top of Lydia. Once there, Tatiana punched Lydia as hard as she could in the throat, which left Lydia choking intensely. Tatiana then grabbed her by the neck and picked her up. She made sure she had her balance, then threw Lydia off the top of the waterfall, resulting in a scream that lasted for about 5-10 to ten seconds before being abruptly interrupted by a cannon. Upon returning to District 2, Tatiana fell into a deep depression, as she had been criticised by Capital viewers for not putting on as much of a show as previous career victors, while she was also shunned by most of her district, who did not trust her after her actions during the bloodbath. She no longer enjoyed living there, and applied to become a peacekeeper, before eventually becoming the head of District 5's peacekeeping unit. She held this role until she was killed in the Victor's Purge of 75. The 54th Games took place in Rocky Riverbeds. It featured violent otters, an immunity pill chase, and lasted for 10 days. You should always keep your friends close, but your enemies even closer. This saying was particularly pertinent this year. This year's victor was Micheli Onassis, age 15, from District 10. When the gong sounded, Micheli aimed to grab some food, and just as she was about to grab a loaf of bread, she was knocked to the ground by Mark from one. He readied his knife and got ready to stab her, but to both Micheli and the capital's surprise, Ezekiel, from two, appeared behind Mark and stabbed him through the back of the head, which killed him immediately. Before Ezekiel could even remove his knife from Mark's head, Micheli had fled and she subsequently dove into one of the nearby rivers, empty-handed but alive. She carried on swimming through the river and used the tide's momentum to push her further from the cornucopia, whilst also having to be careful of the otters, who would often gather on the river banks but sometimes venture into the water in an effort to attack any tributes that they could see. Therefore Micheli only left the river at night in order to sleep, but spent the rest of the time swimming down the river, and although she had access to water from the river, she did not have any food and therefore started to grow hungry. However, on the evening of the third day, when Micheli had started feeling extremely famished and unable to swim much further, she rested by the bank of the river, considering how she could possibly get some food. She had seen sponsors gift food in the past, so she said to the nearest camera she could see that she urgently needed food. She was unsure about whether this had even been registered by the camera, and so she said in a louder voice that she needed food, and then grew frustrated and started shouting at it. Just as she lay her head in her hands and started to cry, she suddenly felt her hair being yanked upwards and her body coming out of the water. Michelle screwed up her eyes and screamed in pain as her body was being pulled from the water. But when she felt herself dangling by her hair, she dared opening her eyes to see Cassia from two sadistically grinning at her with a knife in her hand. However, when Cassia was just about to plunge her knife through Michelle's heart, Ezekiel ran up behind Cassia and shouted at her to stop. Cassia hesitated and seemed annoyed with Ezekiel, but he pointed out that they could use Michelle to walk ahead of them and test for traps. Unbeknownst to Michelle, Fernandez from Three had been setting tree collapse traps along several of the main paths, which had eliminated six other tributes and had almost killed Ezekiel and Cassia earlier that day. Therefore, Cassia somewhat begrudgingly dropped Michelle to the ground. Over the next three days, this plan was put into effect, with Michelle walking ahead of Ezekiel and Cassia. But luckily for Michelle, the group only came across two traps, which she managed to avoid without receiving any injuries. They also captured and cooked the otters, which allowed them to eat, whilst they also drank water from the river. However, it soon became clear that Cassia resented Michelle being with them, and there were several instances when Cassia tried to convince Ezekiel to let her kill Michelle, sometimes even when Cassia knew that Michelle was in earshot. This did indeed worry Michelle, and she thought of running away, but she also guessed that if she did this, then the pair would easily track her down and kill her. By the morning of the seventh day, there were still ten tributes left, so the game makers announced to the tributes that they had ten minutes to grab pills from the cornucopia that would make them immune to a flesh-eating virus that would be leaked into the cornucopia after the ten minutes had ended. 
Whilst the trio quickly made their way to the cornucopia, Ezekiel said that he would wait by the edge of the cornucopia clearing with his bow and arrow in order to cover Cassia and Michelli, who he suggested should both approach the platform containing the pills, but from different directions, which would give the group as a whole a better chance of retrieving the pills. Michelli and Cassia ran towards the pill platform, and Cassia was the first to grab three pills, however just as she turned around to run back, she was tackled to the ground by Joan from five. Whilst Cassia was being tackled, Michelli was about to grab a pill, but she was hit with a throwing knife by Ralph from five, just before she made it to the platform. Ezekiel realised that he could only save one of the two girls and without hesitation shot Ralph in the head with an arrow, which allowed Michelli to get back up and grab two pills, whilst Cassia was stabbed repeatedly in the neck by Joan. Michelli then ran back to Ezekiel with the pills before they fled back towards the river. Ezekiel and Michelli took the pills and within minutes they heard the shrieks of several other tributes around the arena who clearly had not managed to reach the pills and were now dying with the total number of surviving tributes after this incident falling to just five. As they ate some more otter meat that night, Michelli asked Ezekiel why he had saved her over Cassia, and he replied that he did not trust Cassia, but he did trust Michelli. Ezekiel then proceeded to tell Michelli that he had been attracted to her since he first saw her when District 10's reaping was televised. Michelli was somewhat surprised and wondering why Ezekiel was telling her this, but as she was processing these thoughts, he reached across and kissed her. Although Michelli found Ezekiel relatively attractive, she was unsure about whether she felt the same way as he did, but she also realised that she could potentially play Ezekiel's attraction to her advantage, so she reciprocated his kiss, and that night the pair became intimate. The pair awoke the next morning to the cannon of Andrew from 8 sounding, which now left just four tributes. They spent the rest of the day heading back to the cornucopia, as they realised that this was where the showdown was likely to happen. As they ate that night, Ezekiel and Michelli exchanged stories about their districts and joked about various topics, but Michelli later admitted in her Victor's interview that during that evening, she was actually starting to develop feelings for Ezekiel and realised that one of them would ultimately have to kill the other in order to win. She also remembered back to past games when career tributes had killed other tributes who seemed to be their friends. Without thinking twice about it, and then she realised that Ezekiel would probably not hesitate to kill her either when the time came. Therefore, when they started kissing again and were about to be intimate, Michelli casually leaned over and grabbed Ezekiel's knife before stabbing it through his head. As he lay dying, she said to him that she was sorry. The next morning, a very intense rainstorm set in, which forced all three remaining tributes back to the cornucopia. Whilst Michelli waited at the side of the clearing, she saw Gloria from Eleven stab Anaya from Nine with her sword. Michelli then waited as Gloria roamed around the clearing, and when she had come close enough, Michelli charged through the clearing towards her. Gloria saw Michelli coming in the nick of time, and managed to stab Michelli in the shoulder, although while she was trying to stab her again, Michelli rammed her knife straight through Gloria's stomach, and as Gloria started to collapse, Michelli stabbed it again through her brain, which killed her instantly. After this, Michelli passed out and had to be airlifted to victory. Upon achieving victory, Michelli moved back to District 10, then got married a few years later and had a daughter, Bianca. When the victor's purge occurred in 75, Michelli was alerted at the last minute to the peacekeepers who were approaching District 10, and she, Bianca, and a few other trusted associates managed to escape by using the sewer system, and because of Michelli's mentor, Jocasta Walker, who led peacekeepers on a wild goose chase around the district in order to find Michelli, whilst Michelli and her company fled to the ruins of a city named Dallas. After the rebellion of 76, Michelli and the others returned to District 10, where they stayed until the reclamation of 88. Like the other surviving victors, except for Hamish Abernathy, who had already fled and been killed, Michelli was faced with the victor's choice. Although she carefully considered both options, she was ultimately convinced by Bianca to move to the capital. The 55th games took place in a tropical jungle. They featured lazy sloths, a tropical storm, and lasted for 24 days. It's an achievement in itself to win the Hunger Games, but it's an even greater accomplishment to become such a strong influence within the capital's culture. This year's victor was Idaho Luther, aged 17, from District 6. As the countdown progressed to zero, Idaho was one of many tributes who could see fruit in the trees that surrounded the cornucopia, and also guessed that there would be water present throughout this sort of landscape. 
he made eye contact with his district partner, Cassie, and they discreetly signalled to each other that they would immediately run from the cornucopia. Therefore, when the gong sounded, Idaho and Cassie, along with a surprisingly high number of other tributes, ran away from the cornucopia. This led to only two tributes dying in the initial bloodbath, and only two more deaths during the first day. Early on the first day, Cassie was delighted to find a mango tree, and declared that it was safe to eat from. Idaho was unsure of what the mangoes even were, and whether or not they were poisonous, but to his surprise, Cassie immediately took a bite out of her mango, then devoured the rest of it within a minute, commenting on how nice it tasted, and saying in a jokingly smug way that she was glad she spent so long at the plant station during training. Idaho was unsure of whether or not this was an elaborate trap, but he decided to give Cassie the benefit of the doubt, and bit into a different mango before devouring it quickly, commenting that it was one of the nicest foods he had ever eaten. Idaho and Cassie then spent the next few days travelling and eating different fruits from the omnipresent fruit trees. They also noticed the sloths in the trees, and Cassie found their mannerisms particularly amusing. However, on the fourth day, after they almost walked straight into Rod from four, killing Louis from twelve, they decided to camouflage themselves, using the mud that had formed after a brief rainstorm earlier. Like most other tributes and capital viewers, Idaho and Cassie were surprised by how few tributes were being killed, with 15 still left by the 10th day. However, this year's games were still being well received by the capital, with many viewers stating that it was good to see how all these different personalities were reacting to the arena and each other. The sloths had also become popular amongst capital viewers, with commentators often laughing at their actions and commenting on their reactions to tributes during live game segments. However, due to the lack of deaths, the game makers launched a tropical storm on day 12, which caused many tributes to move around in order to find shelter. Unfortunately for Cassie and Idaho, the intense rainfall washed the mud off their skin and they became uncamouflaged. They ran away to look for shelter, but after a minute of panicked rushing, they ran straight into the clearing that contained the career's base. The four of them immediately chased after Idaho and Cassie, who ran back in the direction that they had just come from. Valorio from one, and Aurelia from two, chased after Idaho, but Valorio knocked himself out by running straight into a tree, which allowed Idaho to escape. Meanwhile, Midnight from one, and Pontius from two, ran after Cassie, but when Midnight slipped and sprained her ankle, they gave up running, which also allowed Cassie to escape from them as well. So although Idaho and Cassie had managed to escape, they were now alone. After the storm stopped and Idaho had put enough distance between himself and the careers, he was completely exhausted and fell asleep up a tree. The next morning he woke up to see a sloth seeping right next to him on the same branch. He jumped and almost fell out of the tree, as he later stated that he initially thought it was another tribute. However, it was then that Idaho had a realisation which many experts think won him the games. He realised that it would not be impossible for someone with his camouflaging skills to dress as and act like a sloth. After all, it would only involve lying in a tree for most of the day, and if he did it well enough, he would be able to follow and spy on other tributes as they travel through the arena. Idaho wasted no time in removing most of his clothes and then covering himself with mud. After all, the jungle was warm enough and he had also seen how good and adhesive the mud was for other materials. As luck would have it, when he was covering himself in mud, he spotted a particularly furry sloth that had already died and was lying nearby. He then ripped off all its fur and covered his entire body in it, before also removing its claws and strapping them to his fingertips. Whilst Idaho was transforming himself, half of the capital's audience was speechless, and the other half were in hysterics. However, it quickly made him a capital favourite, and whilst he was looking for colours of mud that he could use to camouflage his face, his first sponsor gift, a variety of makeup colours, was gifted to him, and he used various colours to paint and contour his face to look as sloth-like as possible. Once he had finished, and he was practising walking like a sloth, the commentators mentioned that he might possibly pass for a sloth to other tributes. As the next day went by, Idaho got used to hanging from a tree and sleeping in the same position as a sloth. He became so convincing at doing this, that even some of the other sloths seemed convinced. However, that evening, Midnight, Velorio, and Pontius approached and walked straight underneath Idaho's tree, but to his delight, they didn't even notice him. Some of the other sloths started to follow the careers, as they seemed to have food, and Idaho decided to join these sloths. That night, the careers left some scraps of meat out after they had finished eating. Although Idaho had been eating fruit throughout the games, he felt a bit undernourished, 
and desperately wanted to eat something more substantial. Therefore he approached the career's base and grabbed their old scraps, whilst Midnight nonchalantly commented that the sloths would eat anything. Idaho then scarpered off in a sloth-like manner with the scraps that he had gathered, whilst also trying not to laugh. That night, when it was dark, he also managed to take a silver chain that was holding one of the career's bags together. Although Pontius was keeping watch at the time and witnessed Idaho doing this, he simply shooed him away from the supplies without suspecting a thing. The days went by and the number of tributes gradually dwindled, but the careers still seemed to have no clue that Idaho was this close to them. Moments when the career pack would discuss the other tributes locations, including that of Idaho, were particularly amusing for the viewers of District 6, especially when he was within earshot and sneaking food from them. However, one afternoon when Idaho was having a nap up a tree in a clearing that was close to the careers, he woke up when he heard footsteps approaching. To his delight, he saw that it was Cassie, However, she was unknowingly walking straight into the career's lair. Desperate to stop her, Idaho whispered her name, which greatly alarmed her when she heard it. However, he waved to Cassie, and once she saw that this sloth was in fact Idaho, she was left open-mouthed in shock and amusement. Idaho carefully climbed down the tree towards Cassie, and they happily hugged each other, but their reunion was abruptly interrupted when Idaho saw that, to his horror, Pontius was standing behind Cassie at the edge of the clearing with a look of bewilderment on his face. He threw a spear at Cassie, which impaled her, and even came close to hitting Idaho. However, as Pontius was quickly trying to retrieve his spear, Idaho lunged forward and scratched his eyes with his claws, and then strangled him by using the chain. As the cannon sounded and the hovercraft approached, Valorio and Midnight came to check what had happened, but Idaho crawled back up the tree, which left Valorio and Midnight to believe that Cassie and Pontius had killed each other. The next few days rolled by, and there were still five tributes left by day 22. Idaho still followed Valorio and Midnight, who were now roaming the arena and killing off any tributes that they could find, but Idaho was desperately trying to find an opportunity to kill one of them, without the other noticing. However, that night, he was sent some matches by sponsors, and when he remembered that it had not rained for several days, he realised that he could potentially set a fire nearby, which would distract the careers. So that night, Idaho used the matches to start a fire close to the careers. Midnight was sleeping, but Valorio was keeping watch, and in a very concerned manner, he approached the fire, wondering how it could have happened. Idaho was up a tree, and considering how he could kill Valorio, who was now standing very close to the fire. But to his surprise, Midnight suddenly ran up behind Valorio and pushed him straight into it. When he tried to get back up, she stabbed him with a spear, which pushed him back down into the fire until he was so badly burned that he couldn't move and then he died, before midnight calmly returned to her blanket and went back to sleep. The next day, Idaho conspicuously followed midnight as she roamed the arena, and he later witnessed her kill Fern from seven. That night, Radia from three tried to attack midnight, but after a brief fight, midnight once again grabbed her spear and thrust it straight through Radia's heart, killing her instantly, whilst Idaho once again considered how to kill midnight. As dawn broke the next day, Idaho and Midnight were instructed that they had to head back to the cornucopia or their trackers would be detonated. As they heard this, Idaho happened to be in a tree right next to where Midnight was. She quickly got up and grabbed her spear, but as she was just getting ready to run, Idaho reached down in a very sloth-like manner, and as Midnight passed him, he scratched her eyes with the claws. She yelped out in pain before looking at Idaho with her now one good eye, and finally saw that this indeed was not a sloth. Midnight tried to jab Idaho with a spear, but her perception was now off, and she was still trying to hold her other eye in pain. Idaho jumped down and pushed Midnight to the ground, while she was still screaming. He then grabbed the silver chain and wrapped it around her neck before tightening it and strangling her to death, leaving him as this year's victor. Upon winning, Idaho was a very popular victor, and was amused to find out that he had created a trend of sloth couture within the capital, where people would wear clothes that used sloth fur, and those who were particularly fashion conscious would do their makeup to look like a sloth. He was offered a position in both District 1 and District 2's training academies to specialise in camouflage techniques, but he ultimately chose to stay in District 6 instead. He married his girlfriend the next year and had three children with her before he was killed in the Victor's Purge of 75.